So in the sacred myth of Easter, there's a story about how Jesus showed up at Lake Galilee on the beach to greet his fisher folk friends at the dawn. First, he directed them to a spot in the lake while they were fishing where they could drop their nets and then catch a huge haul of fish. Then he beckoned them to a campfire where he had prepared fish and bread for them. Come and have breakfast, he said. Come and have breakfast. Maybe that's all the theology that we need. Think about it. Breakfast. What's it about? It's simple. Usually we wind up having the same thing every morning, right? It's simple. There's something sweet about it. There's something intimate about having breakfast with someone. And yet at the same time, it's informal. It's kind of open-ended. It's, uh, it doesn't set up a lot of expectations. Dinner can seem serious, you know? But breakfast, a different thing. Uh, 30 years ago, about this time, I invited Roberta to breakfast. And uh, I thought that was the least threatening or uh, intimidating way to get started getting to know Roberta. Yeah. Problem was, we had breakfast, and we've been together ever since. So <laughs> Breakfast all the way. Oh well. Magic happens at breakfast. At the break of dawn, with the day ahead of, ahead of us, to put that magic into action. Come and have breakfast. It's a new day. The past three days are as the past, as the past three weeks are the past, as the past three decades are the past, as the past three billion years are the past. The past is the past, right? We are biologically engineered to sleep. In order to clear our brains and reset our minds so that we can think new thoughts and have new experiences and see things in a new way. At breakfast, we resurrect and start over. Yeah? Born again. Every breakfast is an Easter. Or can be. This is a cool story, you know, from the scripture. That Jesus fed fish and bread to his fisher folk friends. Where did he get the fish, by the way? <laughs> These guys are out fishing. They're the ones getting the fish, but somehow when they get to the beach, he's already got the fish cooked at the fire with bread to serve them. Mysterious. Yeah. And of course, it's mysterious that, uh, uh, and, and boggling to the disciples that they throw the net in and catch all these fish that he tells them where to throw the, throw the net and they pull out all this incredible catch. So that was magical. So I suppose, you know, you know, since we're this deep into magic, then sure, somehow magically Jesus got some fish to feed them before they even got to the shore with the fish. Hmm. So magic is at work here, right? But there's something else at work here too. People are still working, Right? Jesus tells the fisher, he tells his fisher folk friends where to catch the fish, but they still have to haul them in. It's a bunch of hard physical work. They still have to pull in the fish. Still have to do the work. Jesus magically gets the fish somehow, but then he has to fillet them and cook them, right? So he has to work too, right? So there's magic, and then there's the work that goes with it. Uh, we have to do the work that goes with the magic of breakfast, the magic of Easter. It's, it's amazing, it's miraculous, the transformations we go through that seem unlikely and impossible. Last week I told you a story about a, a memorial service for uh, one of our homeless guys back in the day when I was the director of the homeless services agency up there in Palo Alto. And we had this ritual, whenever one of our folks died, we would get in a circle and take a loaf of bread, and I'd say, okay, take the bread, take a piece, and say your piece. 
And then they rip off a piece, say what they had to say, and then pass it around and then eat the bread. As I said last week, we did a lot of those services, those events, because a fair number of our folks died of one thing or another. Uh, one of our, uh, another, and I told you a story about one of those events, I'll tell you a story about another one. And this was the death of a guy named Little Richard, alcoholic, lived on the streets for years, finally died of drink. Very beloved guy. Uh, wouldn't hurt a flea. Just, a, you know, a sweet guy, but with a, a tough problem. He died, we had the memorial, and there was a guy there uh, by the name of Ed, and Ed was an alcoholic too, and he used to drink a lot with little Richard, and um, he showed up at the memorial, and he was just getting more and more and more upset, and then he snuck out for a little bit, and we realized he was drinking, he comes back drunk, obnoxious, messed up, we had to like walk him out of the room, right? Crying, completely freaked out. Uh, a sad moment in this occasion. It was also the last time that Ed ever drank. That was it. That was his moment. Um, he was cured by a memorial service. Cured by the death of his friend Richard. Death, resurrection. There it was. Uh, and that's magical. That's amazing. That's a miracle. It, was, it felt like a miracle for this guy who'd been so deep into it for so long to come out of it and get sober. But, of course, there was work involved. You know, he had to do the work. It wasn't just as easy as snapping your fingers, you had to participate in this resurrection process fully. But the magic happened in that moment, in that memorial. Uh, death prevailed over by life. You know, we, uh, at, uh, at Easter we get to celebrate these transformations. We get to, we get to think about what, what needs to die and be reborn in our lives, you know? What do we need to give up the night before and wake up in the morning convicted and convinced that we need to do differently? Easter morning, a time to let go of resentments and release unrealistic expectations and uh, let go of grudges that just hold us back from life, from the resurrection of life. Come and have breakfast. That's the invitation. And the theology behind it is, breakfast, as I say, is intimate. Sitting around a campfire, sharing a meal, sitting over a cup of coffee and some waffles. It's intimate. And that's the theology of Easter. There is more to the story of Easter, of course. If you look at it, there's this, these passages that kind of suggest that Easter has cosmic uh, significance, cosmic consequences. It's kind of cool. When Jesus dies on the cross, the uh, curtain in the inner holiest of holies of the temple in Jerusalem, according to the myth, was ripped in half torn in half and there was an earthquake and there was darkness in the sky right cosmic stuff happening and what it symbolized is that at Easter the idea there was that the God who was at the highest heaven you know the, the ancients believed that there were seven heavens discs you know see the earth was a disc they didn't know about it being round they just knew it was a disc at a curve, and then curved disks over that, and then at the top, the seventh heaven is where God is, right? The highest heaven. And then God rules the world through these successive heavens. And the early Christians, what they believed was that when Jesus came 
crap. That whole system was broken open. And the cosmos was transformed. The universe had changed. And now, God in the highest heaven was on earth, directly encountering people, having breakfast with them. Yes? Right down on the campfire ground with them. So it's a cosmic event that we're celebrating. Now, all that stuff in the scripture is kind of quaint. It's a reflection of ancient cosmology that doesn't match up with what we know about how the universe is structured at all. But I think the meaning behind that, there's still cosmic uh, uh, consequences to Easter because what it kind of reflects is a new consciousness, right? That in this gargantuan universe that we live in, at least in one little corner of it, one obscure region of it, in some obscure galaxy called the the Milky Way, in one place, a, a level of love, a kind of love emerged that was so extreme that it went beyond anything seen before. You know, a mother bear will guard her cubs. A mother human will guard her children. And that's natural and normal for us. But to love your enemies, right? To love, to forgive the people that killed you, which Jesus did on the cross, that's, that's next level, dude. That's, that's something else, right? That's, that's beyond That's a beyond-the-norm kind of love. So for that kind of love to emerge in the world is a a moment in natural history of tremendous consequence. Yes? And the story of Easter is about that. It describes that transformation in human history and in the natural evolution of the universe. So... Having breakfast with with the disciples, you and I having breakfast together, uh, this represents uh, a higher consciousness and a change in the cosmos that is expressed in this beautiful myth. At Easter, we reawaken that higher consciousness in ourselves. We recommit to embodying it in the ways that we live and treat each other. It's the deeper meaning of what the early Christians said to each other at Easter in Greek, in the Greek language. They said, Christos anesti, alethos anesti. Christos anesti, alethos anesti. Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Come and have breakfast. As Jesus, in his last meal with his friends, his fisher folk and other friends, lifted up the cup, this is my life poured out for you. Take and drink. And he took the bread and said, this is my body. Take, partake of it. Enter into it and let it enter into you. So let us do as we celebrate the Eucharist together. And after you've had your bread and wine, or grape juice in this case, pick up bread and fish. Come and have breakfast.